Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I am your host, Mike Malatesta. On this podcast, I dig in deep with every guest to get to the roots of their success, to discover not just how it happened, but why it matters. My mission is to expose the ideas and clues you need to inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the How Did It Happen podcast powered by Winject Studios. I'm happy to have you here today as I am every time we do an episode together. And I'm fulfilling my promise to you today with another amazing success story. I've got Trent, Trent M. Clark with me. Trent, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. How are you, buddy? Thanks for having me. Uh, long time no see. Um, yeah, yeah, I feel like it's been like uh, at least days since we recorded a show together. <laughs> so Trent and I had an opportunity to, to uh, record um, an episode of his podcast, Winners Find a Way, uh, a week or so ago. So it was a tremendous introduction that I forget if Justin made it. I don't know who, but um, I was so taken back by uh, him and when he did when I was on his podcast that I invited him on here. And you'll find out uh, why I made such a wise decision. <clears throat> as we go along. But um, let me tell you a little bit about Trent. So Trent is a serial entrepreneur and a three-time, that's three-time Major League Baseball World Series coach. He's also the founder of Empower Athletes Incorporated, Courage Coach, and Leadershipity.com. Trent has received accolades as both an athlete and a coach. He served over 12 seasons in Major League Baseball, including three trips, as I said before, to the World Series, working with the, the, the Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Indians, and the Los Angeles Angels. He's worked on staff with famed personalities, coaches, and executives like Mark Shapiro, Nick Saban, Tom Izzo, Sparky Anderson, as a sort of a blast from the past there, <laughs> Sparky, uh, and a bunch of others, like an amazing group of people that he has had the opportunity to work with. Trent is also a nationally recognized certified coach and speaker. He's a seven-year member of the entrepreneur organization, EO, and has served on their global boards, and he operates as, a, as an EO mentorship facilitator worldwide. As a professional speaker, Trent has served organizations for over 25 years, providing motivation and useful knowledge transfer from the lessons of sport to practical business application. You can find out more about Trent uh, at Leadershipity, which is a very interesting name, leadershipity.com. Uh, you, can, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. You can email him, Trent at leadershipity.com. And I advise you to listen to his podcast, Winners Find a Way. So Trent, uh, I start every show with the same simple question, and that is, how did it happen for you? Yeah, so how it happened for me was what I like to call, Mike, an audit of excellence. Uh, I was a young kid. I wanted in seventh grade, I had this teacher who was probably calling it in the week before spring break, but he wanted career week, right? Like, what's life going to be like when we're 30? And I was from a sports family. My father, my, my father was a basketball player. My brother, oldest brother player, was a hockey goalie. My next uh, brother was an all-state you know, football player and all of us played sports in college. And I just decided at that time, my, my, my sister was just named Miss Michigan Teen. And I thought, man, I'm better than all my brothers and sisters. I'm going to play in the major leagues. And so, man, that just really set me on a course of setting some goals. And that was kind of my first blush with goal setting. And then uh, something very powerful happened about two years after that, which was I, I got a Willy Wonka type invite to the showcase camp, which back then there wasn't showcases, right? And uh, it was run by a former major leaguer. And man, that was just so important. I just remember just thinking, man, I got to get that invite. And when I did, it said in the fine print, like if you were named the MVP, you get to sit down with the major leaguer. And I thought, man, I got to do that, right? <laughs> like, so mm. I got to know. And so I just put my head down. I trained hard. I'm hitting and running and lifting weights and getting ready and Needless to say, opportunity meets preparation, right? And uh, and had a great week, 
was named MVP of the camp and I got to sit down with the guy, right? And, uh, and, and I got one of the best lessons I ever got, Mike, in my life, which was uh, when I sat down with him, he asked me, hey, what would you like to do, Trent? And I said, hey, I want to do what you did. I want to play in the major leagues. And he said, all right, seeing you all week. And I think you can do it. And I was like, oh, man, my really? shoulders must have dropped an inch and a half, right? I mean, I was just geared up. And I said, man, I, that's so awesome. But then probably just stupid teenage boldness, right? I, I asked the next question, which was, man, I, I, I got to ask you, with all due respect, everybody else is telling me no, right? Like, he said, well, let me ask you, Trent, like, who are those people? I said, well, you know, my mom, <laughs> my, my freshman coach, my, my, you know, counselor, like, you know, hey, you better have a backup kid, right? Like, you're, you're not big enough, you're not fast enough, you're not strong enough, and I'm hearing in my own vo head now, I'm telling myself, you're not enough. And he said, hey, I'm going to caution you, Trent, like, but you should think really hard who you get advice from as you go forward here, that you should probably only take advice from people that have done what you want to do. And I, I, yes, sir, I will do that. And I took that advice from, from that point forward. Right. And now here I go into state championship, my sophomore, junior, senior year in baseball, never done before in Michigan, the high school team that went to three state championships in a row. And, uh, and then I played in the junior college national championships in tennis. So five years in a row, I'm playing in these championship level games, matches, playing against the top tier talent and just audit of excellence, audit of excellence. Why are they winning? Why are we losing? Why did we win that? It was a consistent challenge in my mind of how can we be excellent every time we go out? And of course we weren't all the time, but it was a constant fight for that, which, which, took me right into the next level of coaching and then coaching in the world series. How do you repeat? How do you become a champion? How do you get your team to do the best things and operate on the, the highest scale? And that has been my total focus since I was a kid. Okay. This, <clears throat> all right. Thank you for that. So one, the ticket, the Willy Wonka ticket, how does one yes. get such a thing? Well, you had to be considered one of the best players in eight counties. So I think he talked to a number of coaches and we okay. played on specialty travel teams and things like that. And I was on, I was selected to one of those teams and had a couple good years. And I was rated one of the best freshman players in the state at that time. So certainly I would fall into that list by some accolades I'd had. Okay. And th this may not be a good question, but I'm going to ask it because I was at, um, I was down in Sarasota not too long ago, and they've got uh, one of those big campuses there, uh, like IG something. Yeah, like IMG. Just, IMG, yeah. So it's like where, I don't know, I want to say, like, uh, reminds me of the uh, Williams movie, um, Serena and uh, yes. Venus, right? Yep. So it's, it's, it's one of these places in Florida where the top athletes are recruited, I guess, to go because they're on a pro trajectory maybe you probably yeah. know a lot more about it than i do but i was wondering yes. how a kid from michigan can compete for the pros particularly in baseball i guess uh and maybe tennis as well your two sports you know against you know you know that kind of the, that, that those kinds of organizations or even just sure. the, the south trying to just yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting dynamic, right? Like, it's always said, like, hey, all the athletes are really coming from the South. And, you know, when I look at, like, baseball, I mean, I know tons of Michigan baseball players that are household names now, like Derek Jeter, right? And uh, there's just there's just tons of them. That if, I, if I went to the major, major leagues that are Michigan kids, and it's not really seen as a baseball hotbed, right? Yeah. I mean, there are probably a lot more Florida and California kids, for sure. But... Um, it still produces a lot of talent. And in tennis, you know, when I was a kid coming up, I, I was playing junior tennis against Malavi Washington, Aaron Crickstein, uh, Todd Martin. I mean, these guys were all top 20 in the world at, at some point in their careers. And uh, you know, I, I just knew they were a lot better than me at 17 right? <laughs> than, than, than mm -hmm. I was. But it was incredible. And I think indoor tennis had a big factor on that because you could train indoors. So instruction was good. And I think that some of the Midwest values, Mike, I think really plays out in sport too, where we are grounded in faith and family and hard work. 
And we really have been taught like the consequences of hard work are good things, right? And the, the consequences of lack of work aren't great. <laughs> and, we, and we saw that many times. So I think the value uh, of, of it was significant. And I, I remember Dusty Baker talking about, you know, a long time major league baseball manager. He goes, you know, these Michigan kids, like they just got to kind of figure it out. Like they're solid. Mm -hmm. And it was the fact of how do you, how do you rate when we looked at these major league players, how do you compete against the top people at the top level? And it really became this, this dynamic of what we were recording and coaching on. And it started with the Cleveland Indians on their real audit to excellence. They were just on it and they were really good at it. Number one minor league team. And they were like, how good are you at taking care of yourself? How good are you at self-discipline? How do, you know, confident are you? What is your competitiveness level? Um, how are you doing on taking care of your fitness? How are you on eating right? And how are you on integrity when no one's watching and all these things? And I'm like, and I tell my kids like, hey, we didn't measure how fast or how hard you could hit a ball because everyone at that level could do that. It was the little things that projected you to that next level. Coachability, one of those big itties, right? And leadership right. is do you coachability. have coachability because do you have adaptability? Do you have integrity and humility? I mean, are you doing all these things that we want in our leaders and we want in our best, but they're not easy to find. And what we find is, Hey, I got two of those, <laughs> but the, but the other two are kind of harming me because uh, I don't eat humble pie. I'm, I'm, I'm great. Just ask me. Right. And you're like, Ooh, that arrogance may become a problem for someone. Right. Yeah, sure. It, it rears its I head all the time. I was thinking about that before you brought it up because I was, I'm still, I'm trying to wrap my head around how a kid, you know, gets this audit of excellence thing in their mind, like you were describing. And then at, because I was thinking so many at that age who are excelling might be feeling like what it, I'm already excellent. Why would I yeah. need to audit my excellence? You know? Yeah. Um, how did you stay away from that? Well, because I wasn't the biggest and the best, right? Like that's, I had to fight for it all the time. I'm five, six, 160 pounds in high school, right? I played at my top level, like 178 and I was still five, six. <laughs> so okay. you know, I didn't get any bigger. You didn't figure and, out a way how to get taller. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't figure out how to get taller. So I got, a, I learned how to get faster. I learned how to get stronger. I learned every single technique of an edge I could get every single thing that counted, you know, studying the game, uh, shaving my face, right? Because, you know, kids don't realize the little things as a scout walks in and you see these 17 year olds with a full grown beard. They're like, Oh, that kid's as mature as he's ever going to get. This is probably as physically good as he'll ever get. Now, can we just mentally train him up? And if, if he doesn't hit that far or doesn't run that fast, they're like writing him off at 17. So like kids don't think about like, well, I want to look like I'm a stud with my, with my beard. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't want, you want to look like a baby face for scouts because they want to think you still have potential to grow and develop. And uh, so it's little things that keep going in because when we audit excellence, everyone knows the big things, right? Mike, like, Oh, Hey, are you good at this? Uh, if in business, if you're auditing excellence, are you good at selling? Oh yeah, we're good at selling. I mean, we're not good at managing our expenses, but man, we could sell all crazy. <laughs> like, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, we, we do 240 million in sales. And listen, we only got 245 in expenses. Like, uh, uh, yeah. Well, so, so you're sense. in the red 5 million. Is that, is that, is that excellent? only, because, only 5 million? <laughs> yeah. Only 5 million. Right. <laughs> and like, Hey, the government yeah. might bail us out. So like, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a bad deal, right? We got to consider all. And I always like to look at these audits as like, as like a swimming pool. And when you look at, you take anything, uh, a business, you take anything and you look at like, hey, each, each part of this pool is a swim lane. And we need a leader in each lane to, you know, like, let's say a business, we need to run marketing and run HR and run sales and run operations and fulfillment. And, you know, we can just keep going down the line of the different operations, right? And the reality is, is that every one of them has to be excellent. They have to be managing their lane at the highest level, high productivity, efficiency. Because what happens is, what if the HR lane just decides like, hey, we're not doing a very good job. We're not running that very well. And all of a sudden, the, the, the lane's getting tainted. 
right? It, it's, well, we're not caring for it very well. So it's, it's starting to grow some algae and starting to turn yellow and green and like, okay, well, in a pool, like it doesn't just limit itself to that lane. Before yeah. you know it, the two lanes next to it are all yellow and they're starting to turn green too. And if we just let it go, listen, the whole pool's affected in, in days, right? We just can't let it go. And I was like, well, we run really well in seven lanes. Well, listen, you've got the pools just filled with algae now. You can't stop it and you got to fix it. You got to repair it. And if you don't get that right, it's going to affect everybody else. And so that's what we learn in the audit of excellence is that it takes everybody in and, and it takes everybody contributing. I love Bill Belichick's quote about great teams, right? He says, I know we'll have a great team when everyone knows what their job is mm -hmm. Two, and they're doing it. Do it. Yeah. So I come into organizations all the time and call me. They call me because they have challenges, right? And that's great. That's what I'm called. That's awesome. But the first thing is I would bet 90% of the time I come into a company, most people don't know their role. They don't know their job. And so if they don't know it, we know they're not doing it, right? Like, and, and we got some expectations like, oh, wow, I hope Joe over there is doing his job. Um, does Joe even know what his job is? Well, probably not, but I hope he's doing it. I mean, hope is not a strategy, right? Yeah. So we run into this, this factor where there's not visibility, there's not clarity on what a person's role and responsibility is. And that's really what we work at hard at leadership. It's like, let's make sure everybody knows their role and responsibility here, how they contribute to the greater good, right? To, to what the mission is of the organization, because everyone plays a role in contributing to, a, to an all-star championship level organization and if people don't know what it is then i doubt they're contributing very well or, or it's not on target it's not focused yeah so but if i've got people that really know their role and responsibility and we're coaching and managing people up on being the best they can be at their role and responsibility and not only meeting the expectation but exceeding it in every category like you're gonna have a fabulous organization very quickly like it just it's, it's magical and it seems somewhat simple, right? But I can't tell you how hard it is to get people moving in all the same direction. It's difficult. There's a couple of things you said in there that I want to, I want to dig into a little bit. The, the first was this, um, this lane thing. So <laughs> how often, <clears throat> how often do you come into organizations where the people that are in that lane think that they shouldn't be in that lane. Like, you know, it's sort of like this, um, I get this, like when you ask people if they're good drivers, right? Like nine out of 10 people say I'm a good driver, even though that's, you know, like, yeah, it's impossible. Right. You know, <laughs> right. So how often do you like, obviously they can't see the algae growing no matter what, but how often do you, do you find that people, and, and I'll get into the know their roles later after this, but, but you know, that they, don't see themselves as not being the right person mm. for that lane. Yeah. I would say most people, um, I would think that most people actually deep down, they know it. Okay. They know it in their mind that they're not, but they're not going to consciously and, and openly admit that. Right. Because I'm in this role I'm trying to do well and I'm working my rear off and um, I will justify, you know, we'd be better, but, Mike keeps giving us bad clients. And that's why, you know, everyone's got a justification. But, but that's why I think the roles and responsibilities are really big because, um, and, and really easy, you know, really easy is here's your job description, which every job application that goes out on the, on the wire has a, here's your role inside the company. So if I just pick that up and I said, hey, this is your job advertisement three years ago when you took the chief marketing officer here. And let me just break this down categorically to 10 things. This is what you've got to do. You know, you've got to own our social media campaign. You got to be budgeting our, you know, marketing campaign. We want ROI return on X amount of dollars. We want pay, pay, click, you know, all the things we could measure, right? And if I just sat down and I said, hey, you know, Tricia, tell me as a chief marketing officer, 10 categories, let's go down each one. How do you feel? you're doing in leading this category, A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. right? If we're going to be honest with ourselves and we're going to have that moment where we're just going to look at our department, first of all, 
no one giving themselves A's. You're saying it can't be better? This is this is absolutely A work, elite level, top notch A. Well, we I mean we could have a lot better click through rate. We you know we could we could be getting our campaigns and a lot better audiences. I think we miss our audience fifty percent of the time. We're we're not in the right places we should be. Like if we're being openly honest, it's like oh B C D A A B C E failing here. Oh, I'm neglecting that area actually. <laughs> you know, we're not doing anything <laughs> like sure. So you're gonna tell me. You're doing championship level work, and I just graded you out at a B minus. Like my next question is: Is how could it be an A? Well, if we did this, if we did that, if we were doing this, it, oh really? Oh, hmm, that's interesting. So, like, guess what? We've got a marching plan and marching orders for the next two quarters because you just laid out. If we want to be top championship level, and this is all A's, we've got to be doing these things. How do I get my team? doing those things and and when they really break it down nobody gives themselves all a's they won't because they can't because like, they can't justify it right yeah. like if i try to justify you mike hey our marketing campaigns are so good i'd be just lying through my teeth and you'd be like hmm trent is that true because explain to me about this this and that and i'd be like oh yeah those aren't very good mike <laughs> like, like, i gotta own that right i gotta take responsibility like we could be doing this better and we got to take ownership in that. And especially if it's, if it's my ownership, it's my role and responsibility inside the organization, who, who, who else would I blame? I could blame my team, but uh, I hired them. I'm responsible right. for them. I'm the one who's running point, who's managing them. How's that going to work? That, I'm so, that's so funny you said that. And, and it seems so weird because you're a coach and I'm at a, at, you know, a major league coach and I'm not. But one of the things that I would always tell our people when they would push back on that was what, well, you know, you selected the team, right? Yeah. Well, then you need to win with the team you have, because if you're telling me that you can't win with the team you have and you selected them, <laughs> what am I supposed to make of that? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I've had a lot of these hard discussions with folks like, uh, you know, and, and here's one as an, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs as do you, Mike, and you'll appreciate this is that owners pay the freight, you know, they, they pay the payroll. Right. And it is, in, in, their, in their concept, it's directly out of their pocket. Like this is a cost of us doing business and doing well. And so when you pay somebody $100,000, right? Let's just use that as an example. Yeah. And then I say, hey, here's your 10 roles and responsibilities. And let's just say of those 10, you're going to give yourself a one to 10. And they go nine, eight, six, 10, two, 10, nine, six. Okay, I add this up at 81. So you're the director and of, a, of an entire division here. We're paying you $100,000 and you're doing 81% of the contribution. So, so, so Mike has paid you. He honored his end of the bargain by paying you in full and in kind for contributing at 100%. And you gave him 81%. Is that correct? Because I'm just wondering if I should go back to Mike and say, hey, he should pay to you 81000 or you're going to come back and actually contribute at the full value. <laughs> like I've never heard anyone say they'll take less, right? Yeah, like, sure. no, 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 I want the money. No, no, I good. And Mike wants the contribution. Like, can we agree that we have to do that together? Well, yeah, I guess that's probably right. That's right. Okay. So now you got me thinking, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you watched us do that. Cause now you have me thinking, well, how do you, that, that, that takes a real, like to, to bring somebody in like you and do what you just described, that takes some real, uh, I don't know if courage is the right word. I don't know if it's the right word. You tell me the right word. But to bring somebody, because it sounds to me like you're getting, when you come in to work with a team, you, you're you in all the lanes, right? And you are asking right. questions of the people that are in that lane right now about why the pool is growing algae, right? Yeah, and quality control. This, but but you're not working through the CEO or the or the entrepreneur. You're getting direct access to these people. Yes, because that's where the change needs to happen. That's that's um, unique in my experience. Like, yeah, but Mike, you're appreciating that. You love Trisha. Let's just say the CMO who just scored an 81. You love her. She's great for your culture. Mm -hmm. She's she's in a position that you just want to see her succeed. That's all you want from her. And there's some gaps. And so you're bringing her in a coach that's going to help her shore up those gaps because the best in the world have a coach. Yeah. Why wouldn't Trisha? 
you want her contribution. And based on her values, based on her ability to lead, based on some other things that she has, her her work uh, uh, effort, her attitude, you see her as a long-term player in your organization. Like, why wouldn't you invest in her? Because ultimately, it serves the organization and the ROI is in perpetuity as she gets better, right? Like the return is that, hey, not only do I come back and learn how to exceed in this role, but now I've learned how to exceed in any role to take on those tasks, those roles, responsibilities, and not just meet the minimum, but exceed on every case. Because if you looked at her 10 and you went 11, Tricia, 11, 11, <laughs> one out of 10, 11 again, like Tricia, you exceed all these things. Like, how come I haven't made you the COO? Because this is who you want. This is, this is who I always, I always tell the story like, hey, if, if, I, if I run a Starbucks and we, we can only be judged on the role we're in, that's it. I can't go, you know what, um, Mike, you're my, you're my uh, vice president of sales or, or vice president of operations in Starbucks, let's just say. And I am a running a store here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? And in my district, there are 12 stores. My store is number 11, right? Mm. So I go to the VP director because you know what, Mike? I think I would be great at your job one day and I want to be you one day and this is what I'm going for. And I, and I just want to be clear about how come you don't think they're considering me for district manager? Because that's the next step. Uh, hey, Trent, your store is 11 of the 12 we have. For the district managers being considered of the top two people in our district, the top two stores, and who's running those things like Pristine and the two top of the district next door because they would be willing to come over if they had a chance to run a district and, and get and get advanced in that, even though sure. it wouldn't be in their hometown. So I'm just not competing inside my district. I'm, cons I'm considering competing against all the other district leaders. So why am I not being considered because I'm 11 of 12? Like, because there's people running fabulous stores and they've proven they can manage themselves with that responsibility. And now they're going to get given more responsibility to run this district. And when they blow this district out of the water and they are the top district in this region, they're going to be considered for the regional VP. And then when they are the top region of all the 10 regions in the country, guess who's getting the VP? The top, re the top regional works. guy. Right. Yeah. The top yeah, regional yeah. person, right? Yeah. She's a world beater. This is who we want running the show because everywhere she's gone, She's made every store better, every district better, every region better. All she does is make things better. Don't, you know, we've been there as coach. You've coached Little League. You've done this. And you, you get a kid who just gives you all the effort, who does every little thing you ask. They may not be the fastest. They may not be the best. But you, you sit there and you go, wow, Alexa. I'll take 10 more just like her. She's a world beater. She comes with the right attitude every day. Like, I want 10 more of these little girls on my team because if I've got 10 Alexis, we're going to kill teams. Right. I'll just tell you right now. <laughs> She's not the fastest. She's not the best. I don't care. Like, I don't need that. I need someone who can actually do what they're asked to do. You, um, it, okay, so- I want to go back to something, but before I do, I got one more question or maybe two more questions on this trend. So the investment part, uh, that makes sense to me intellectually. I think it would make sense to most people intellectually, like, hey, we're going to invest in you to get you up to your tens, right? Because that's where yep. we think you, you, you can be, and that's where we need you to be in order for our organization to be the best it can be, right? So sure. how many, how often do, like, I've, I feel like intellectually that makes sense, but when it's like, Oh, Trent's here to talk to me. How many people feel like you're the company's investing in them as a result of going through this, as opposed to they're scared that they're being held accountable uh, to yeah. something? Well, I, I, you know, it's a great question. I've never pulled them. How many people showed up scared? I think there's a lot of deer in the headlights when I show up on on site that people are nervous about that. I I didn't know, you know, my one of my favorite words of itties is accountability. And it feels like a four letter word now, Mike, like, yeah. it's like, whoa, wait a minute. You're going to come and hold me accountable. Yeah. Like, don't, don't you want to learn like that? And, and this is my worst scenario, Mike, 
My worst case scenario is someone walks in and goes to the boss and goes, hey, why are you firing me? I, I, didn't, I didn't even know I wasn't doing well. I'm like, mm -hmm. wait, no one told Brian he's struggling at this thing? No one told him he's not meeting expectations? No one told him what his roles and responsibilities are? No one told him? that he's getting D's across the board on these? Are we having quarterly reviews? Are we coaching him up on how he could get A's? Are we giving goals? Are we setting anything in advance? And man, crickets. It's yeah. like, so, so, so this is what I learned, Mike. No one went to university and school to learn leadership and no one went to learn coaching. Yet every one of these organizations, any organization needs good leadership and they need coaching. And I need coachability out of my out, out of my members, right? Because we want teams of coachable champions. That's what we want. Because if we have that, we're going to be going places if we've got anybody who can coach it up. And so the question is, is do we have those things? And I'd say most often, most organizations just don't have them. We want coachability. Um, yeah. And that's awesome. We should be hiring for it. But what if we have coachability and no one to coach them? No one talking to them. No one telling them, "Hey, how do I get better? How do I how do I improve? How do I make the next level? What's next for me? What are my opportunities? How do I show you I'm worth it?" Here's the things, right? This is what we'd love to see from you. When you were walking through that example, two things came to mind. First of all, uh, yeah, nobody ever talked to him. Everybody just talked to themselves about how horrible of a job that person was doing, right? So that's one. And two, you said quarterly reviews. And I could just, quarterly reviews? Who the hell's got time for that? We got, you know, it's like you, you just sort of abdicate all this responsibility for uh, helping people become yeah. the best they can because you don't actually want to address them. And the, yeah. the, 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 the accountability is a four letter word thing. Yeah. It sort of reminds me of like accountability is sort of like bullying today. Right. It's like, if you're holding me accountable, people, you're, some people feel like that's, you know, you're being unfair to the person you're being, you know, you're bullying yeah. them. No, no, you're not doing that. You're actually doing them a big favor. Most people take that. Well, if you, you know, as long as, as long as you present it yeah. well, and as long as they're not the only ones they don't feel like they're the only ones being held accountable. Cause I yeah. used to hear that all the time. Like, well, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean? I'm not doing my, well, look at, they immediately want to deflect and say, well, look at Trent. Yeah. He's lazier than I am. He comes in <laughs> late. He leaves early. All this <laughs> right. like yeah. immediately no. deflection. Yeah. 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 Feedback is a gift. Right. But that's not yeah. again, like accountability. It's all of a sudden I'm in trouble. Yeah. Feedback is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, and this is a, this is a challenge with the younger generation. Like everyone goes, oh, you know, um, these these you know the younger they really want feedback. No, they want they they don't want that. They want encouragement and praise. <laughs> like they don't want to hear the negative feedback. Like wait a minute, like I grew up well, and and maybe part of it's my world. I mean, baseball. You know, you 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 make five million dollars if you're successful three out of ten times, right? Like it's crazy. And right. so, um, I just can't ever imagine right? That, that we pay you $10 million, Mike, and you go to the plate and you strike out against a Randy Johnson or name the top pitcher of the day, right? And then you come back to the dugout after the first inning and go, you know what? It's just too hard out there. I'm not going back. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> no, you're going to have three more chances. Like, you know, you're going to have four at bats this game. This is why you hit number two or three, because you're the guy who can get to somebody and make something right. happen. Right. And it just, it just would never enter anybody's mind. We just continue to adapt. And, and you know, in that feedback, you and I are close friends. Right. And so we sit there and I say, man, you know, you see the fact like, Hey, I'm dropping my back shoulder and dipping my shoulder. And so three weeks go by that I strike out more than I have all season. <laughs> like, and I don't, I don't strike out very much. I was, you know, I struck out twice in my senior year in college. So like, I don't do that. And so that's not my game. I gotta, I gotta be, I put the ball in play, make things happen guy. Right. So I strike out all these times. My average is going terrible. I'm not getting on base. And after three weeks, the club comes to me and goes, well, Trent, we got to move you down. We got to send you to triple A. You got to work this thing out. And you go, Hey, listen, um, I hope you're back up here soon. And listen, that back shoulder has been dropping for like three weeks. And I just, you know, get, get there and work on it. I'm like, wait, you, you know, this for three weeks and you're not telling me like, 
How are you helping me, good buddy? Like, now you're telling me, oh, I didn't want to make you feel bad. Well, you think when I was hitting 105, I was feeling good? You know, like, you're not feeling good anyway. Like, I I got to fix this and I I need help. And we're just not asking our our trusted friends for help and, and taking that as just that. It's, it's help and guidance and, and we all need it, right? We all need it. We can't, we can't hold up a mirror to ourselves all day. We're not, we're not great at self-assessment. We need some people on the outside to help us kind of guide through that. And I would say, I would add to that. What do you think? Like, we never assess ourselves as honestly as someone else will. Yeah. I love the, I love the famous quote that, you know, um, we judge others by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Intentions. Yeah. Yeah, like, oh, man, I, I intend to go up there and take three good swings. And, man, look at look at Malatesta. His swing's looking like crap, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm hitting 105, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I intend to really go up there and hit line drives. Like, no, 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 yeah. you're not actually doing it. I, I ran into this with an executive that I was coaching. And fabulous leader, good leader, bad on time. And so hard worker. Uh, not a particular morning person. He had the standing meeting at 745 with his team, 745 every Friday. And his team would come in and bring like, you know, the, their, their laptops and some reading material and anything they needed to do. So if, if, so if the meeting kicked off at 755, they didn't waste 10 minutes. Like they were on it. Uh, right. But they're all there ready to go at 745. Cause many times he was there at 745. He has, a really critical employee um, that's in the sales department who's really challenged uh, with time. And he's, he's missed a couple RFP dates, deadlines. So they, they didn't even get chances to offer him the business because he missed deadlines. And so he fired him for his inability to manage time. And everyone went, uh, uh, wait a minute, like his what? Like, uh, Hey, uh, my intent is to be there every time. Like, no, no, no. We all know that, but like, you're not good at it. Like it, it, it was, it was a, he took a step back for like six months as a leader, like, and you know, and he didn't understand it. Like until we had to break it down. Like, Hey, listen, they're looking at you. Like do as I say, not as I do. Right. Like you're a horrible model of this and you, you could have let him go for anything, but he said this and like, wow. You know, does that mean you how should be he, fired? How like, did he not tough. see that? How did he not see that? Because yeah, because our intentions, man. Yeah. You know, like we you just, said, we can talk ourselves into like, oh, and we justify stuff, it, right? Like, yeah. oh, you know, my, my wife's out of town. I had to drop the kids off. I, you know, I, I thought they started school at eight. It turns out they started at 820. I couldn't get them out of the car till 740. And I'm nine minutes from the office. And sheesh, man, like, I, I didn't you know my wife was going to be gone this Friday. And, you know, da, 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 like. Okay, you know, like, but then it's, uh, yeah, the racquetball game ran over, and then uh, there's a wreck on I five, and like, it's always something, yeah. And it's there's not an intent in the world not to be there at seven forty five, but it happens two times out of the month, which is half, right? <laughs> that you're only doing four Fridays, brother. Like it's half, like, and so fifty percent of the time is not a great ratio. So now you're gonna sit there and say, hey. This guy missed an RFP twice out of 60, 50. I don't know. So it's just tough. I mean, I think it's tough, you know, understanding it, getting clarity. It's not easy. Yeah. And, you know, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it, right? If that's what they say, yeah. The, <laughs> um, I look at, yeah, I'm, I'm an over easy person. I look at everything as being easy, although I know I, I've, obviously it's not once you get into it, everything is hard really. But, but conceptually, it's easy. And if you approach it as if it's easy, you're going to make it easy. If you approach it as if it's complex, you are likely to make it complex. At least that's been my personal experience. It's good. You mentioned roles and the lack of really uh, clarity when it comes to a lot of roles. So you've been in a lot of different companies. Like, Why would that be? What's, what is the reason why there wouldn't be clarity about that? As you said, you know, the the, the job description has it in there, but usually they got everything in the kitchen sink in those job descriptions, right? So it's like, you know, sometimes it feels like you need two sentences 
that say what your job really yeah. is in order for you to know your role. But what's been right. your experience about why that happens so so frequently? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is we're not, we aren't trained very well. We aren't given that right from the beginning. Let's break that out of that big job description and break down here are the eight real responsible things that you that you own that you are responsible for, you run point and you will answer to at any given time, e even if you're not doing it, right? Even if I've assigned Mike and his team to do it, I am still ultimately responsible. I can delegate that to, to, to you who can do it better than me, by the way, which is why I hired you on my team in the first place, right? Because uh, you're better than I am at it and I am not strong here and we need to get stronger. So a, a good leader is going to do that too, is we don't understand chain of command. I mean, can you imagine like a ball club that someone who's cleaning the bathrooms at the stadium is out of toilet paper. So they call the president of the Los Angeles Dodgers to say, Hey, where do you think I'd get more toilet paper? Like there's a chain of command <laughs> issue there. Like, no, no, no. Like, why would you call that person? You have a direct boss and a direct boss is an authority. Another four letter word now, big mm. itty, right? But, you have to be an authority. You're in a position of management now. Own your authority. And yet that doesn't mean you hold your authority over people. Just understand that it is your role to where is your authority? My authority is over these eight things. My authority is over this team. My authority is over these things, and I am responsible for that. That is what it means to be the authority in the matter. Now, am I the authority over here in sales? Like, the, I'm I'm not today. I'm not, I'm not the authority of that. Like, um, you know, Rihanna's doing that. She's great. Like, like if you, and so when there's a sales issue, I'm like, I, I don't know if you talk to Rihanna because she's the best and she's the authority. Why? I, I don't offer what you need. And so understanding that, I think, so that chain of command is an issue, but if we're not trained up in systems and that's why, you know, you talk about a quarterly, like I'm not, I'm not giving quarterly assessments of, everyone in my organization, like I have a chain of command and you, Mike, are, are responsible for your eight members on your team. You're doing those eight quarterlies because you're the one who knows them intimately. You're the one who has to coach them up and you have a quarterly with your boss who right. your, you know, is your authority in this. And when you have a challenge, you don't call me first. You call your direct boss that you report to. And you say, hey, listen, I'm having a challenge with this client, with this person. You know, this is what I've done so far. This is what I think is a potential solution. You know, all these things. Um, but, you know, I just think that organizations just, we, we've kind of lost this sense of, of uh, time, urgency, uh, of timelines. And I'll tell you right now, I mean, I think a lot of it starts in the school. When you and I went to school, I mean, can you imagine showing up Friday for an exam and, um, I'm not really ready. You think I could take it Tuesday? Sure, you could take it Tuesday. Um, that's fine. Your grade will be worth 50% now. We will automatically cut. So if you get 100% right, it'll be worth 50 points. Ooh, that's a serious consequence. Right. <laughs> like, I, 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 make, I, I think I better just wing it and see I if I can get 65 it, yes. right now. <laughs> like, right? Like, because I got to weigh my options. But how would you and I feel when Mike and I have studied our butt off all week We've been up late working at it. The exam comes and, and here comes our buddy, Chad. And he walks in and goes, ah, Tuesday. She's like, oh yeah, no problem, Chad. Full, full value. You could do it Tuesday. What? Wait, what? Like, no, no, no. Like yeah. we did our stuff. Like we're ready. And like, there's no penalty for not being ready. Like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and make them feel bad. What? Like, how's that work? Like that all of a sudden gives us no ability to, to lean on, on one another. Our whole team is broken down now because we can't lean on the other person to do and their work and hold each other up. I mean, can you imagine if, uh, you know, Henry Ford develops the assembly line and the guy over there is leaning on his elbow going, yeah, I, I, I couldn't put the left uh, front tire on today. I, you know, I wasn't feeling it. I it didn't rest well last night. So I, uh, and, 970 cars come out without a tire. Yeah. Like, uh, Hey, Trent, uh, you're fired <laughs> immediately. <laughs> like, yeah, you can't you come doing? back. Like, you can't come back on Tuesday and put the tires. <laughs> That's yeah, not right. work, hey, right. if you just stuck them in that back lot, I, I could, I could probably get them done over the weekend. Like, what are you talking about? Put right. them back on the line. Not happening, not happening. And so 
we've 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 the, my my fear my i don't know if that's a word but i don't know if that's the right word but my my concern is that tolerance is acceptance and so we've tolerated this poor behavior again and again and again and now people don't know that it's not acceptable yeah when you say that, as you were going through that, I was thinking a couple of things too. One, you know, the, the unacceptable thing I get, the, you know, making an accommodation because you feel sorry for the person or they've got a story or whatever is like um, one of those easy sort of feel good responses to something that's teaching a lesson that's going to, you know, potentially get that person fired from every job they ever take. Yeah. Right? Like, Correct. Because the rest of the world's not going to be like, oh, like you just said, oh, you can't. Oh, yeah. It was the, the RFP was due on Tuesday. And yeah, you could, uh, you weren't up for it. Yeah. Okay. So you, so we submitted it on Thursday. And of course, <laughs> we didn't get it because it was due on Tuesday. <laughs> that went directly to the circular file. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you're teaching people to, have a life of unfulfilled uh, uh, capability because that all comes from doing things on time, even if they're hard, even if you don't feel like it, even if you're not ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I call that tough love. Yeah. But what people don't understand is like, that is love. Like I am showing you how to be disciplined, how to self-manage, how to prioritize and take things seriously, how to be a contributor, be an adder to an organization. Because if you don't contribute and you're a subtractor all the time, like nobody needs you. You don't add any value. You're a subtractor. You take away. And right. last time I looked, like if you come into my organization and you take away from it, I'm not paying you anymore. <laughs> like I'm not paying you more. You're not getting raised up. You're not getting a bonus. Like none of those things are happening by being a subtractor. And so it's, and, and no one really wants to see themselves as a subtractor, right? But, but these, these behaviors are, and actions are considerable. And while it's not their intent to miss deadlines, actions are happening. And we're being judged on those actions all the time. I mean, and, and sometimes unjustly. And, and I do not want to give the impression, Mike, that there's not empathy for people, that there's not you know, something that we need to come alongside and coach folks up. But if we're not going to give them the ability to learn and adapt to those situations and deliver and contribute in, in a very positive and additional way to an organization – They've set themselves up for not having an ability to maintain employment, to maintain a household, to maintain their payments and their mortgage. This is this is set up for a lot of years of hard effort and, and despair. It's just not fair. That didn't need to be that way. Yeah. And it, empathy is, you know necessary and valuable, but that's not empathy. What you were describing, right? It, that's dismissal. That's basically saying it's okay. Um, that doesn't help people. Yeah. What helps people is like you said, be empathetic, but then you take the test. You know? Yeah. You know? I, because I wrote a, I wrote a speech um, that I taught that I gave to a school called don't do me any favors. And because I saw so many athletes when I was 30 years old, that had come through these programs, they were, they were superstars at 12. Like most people in the professional ranks, most, not everybody, but most are, are early adapter superstars. They are physically gifted. They're mentally gifted for this. They have an ability to learn. There's a lot of skill sets. And so I see teachers that are like, hey, you know, Mike, uh, don't, don't worry about the biology test. Uh, listen, how about putting up 30 on Friday night? All right, buddy, you know, like, wait a minute, don't, don't do me any favors. Now Mike gets to college and, and he can't stay eligible to be on the basketball court because he doesn't know how to study. He doesn't know how to do his work and because we've let somebody off the hook. We've, we've, we've done what I call, oh, I'm a favor for you. This is a favor to you. Like it's not a favor. You know, not holding people accountable is never a favor. That's, that's never helping anybody because at some point you are going to answer 
<laughs> to it. And, and when you can't, then you don't like the results. Like, well, you know, blah, this is, this is baloney. They wanted me to do all the things in my job. Like yeah. what's up with that? Like, you know, and, and, and then it's deflecting. You know what? Diana doesn't do that. And you know, Brian sucks this and, mm -hmm. and we're deflecting. Like, wait a minute. I'm just talking about clarity on your eight. I don't, you know, she'll have her own meeting and he'll have his own meeting, but let's just talk about your meeting right now. Cause we're talking about you. Yeah. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I don't want to talk about me. No, no, I get that. So Trent, when you were answering the, how did it happen question, you said something uh, when you were talking to the, the, um, the coach or whoever the MVP at the showcase thing was like the top person. And yeah. you said that this, this, you're not enough, which you'd been hearing all these times with, you said that you, you heard that from your mom. And I thought, what is that all about? Like, Cause most people's moms are the, are the opposite. They're the, yeah, you can my, listen, do it. And my you mom, are... my mom and God bless her. She's awesome. Um, you know, she told me I can do anything. You know, she would never tell me I couldn't do something, you know, yet there's a real, a, a realistic, you know, thing that we didn't know any major leaguers. Right. Um, you know, I played against Steve Avery when I was a kid. And when you saw him, you're like, whoa, that, that guy's going to be a major leaguer. Like you knew it when he was 16 years old, you know, big kid, six, two throwing, you know, 93 miles an hour. <laughs> we were, it was the fast, first time I'd ever seen 90 miles an hour. And it was like, someone shot a BB at me. And I was like, am I supposed to see that? Like, yeah. it's, it's crazy. So, you know, I think, I think my mom just wanted me to have a backup plan, right? Like, this is great. I want you to go for it, but this isn't for everybody, right? And um, as, as you've learned probably, Mike, that um, some of the greatest accomplishments in this world has been like, it's, it's this or it's nothing, right? Like I am cutting the line to the shoreline and we're sailing and there's no going back. Right? Like, this is it. We're either going to find it or there's no going back. Right. And so uh, I, I had a great discussion with a good, good friend of mine, Bobby Magianas. He's a hitting coach for the Atlanta Braves. He was like, man, you know, I, I, I wish I had gone to school. I wish I had a backup plan, but like, I don't know if that's actually would have served him. He is a major league coach, just won the world series. He's put his head down. He has been, absolute resolute through it all right um and uh he's just fabulous i mean in relentless because there's no plan b and so some of that says like hey if 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 that serves you you know that's that's pretty powerful and i don't know what the right answer is i don't, I don't know if plan b is is great and pivot and adapt and transition. And like you say, you shift, I'm going to shift mm -hmm. over to plan B because it's a good option. And, and, you know, ownership is great. Like directing us how we can do that out of your book. And, but some people who go like, there was never a plan B it's this <laughs> or nothing, right? There is a, there is a relentless pursuit of that that separates a lot of people. What about you? What about your plan B? What about when baseball was, and tennis were yeah i mean uh i got hurt i got hurt and i and and all the time i don't think i um i don't think i was relentless when i really look back no. at me as a player yeah with an audit of excellence you weren't relentless i was relentless about excellence but um i was relentless about excellence in a lot of things i was relentless about excellent student you know i was an honor student i was on the president's list for i don't know i think six semesters in college i mean I, I wanted to be excellent for sure. Um, but if, if I had to look back as a, as a 21 year old and where my priorities were, knowing what I know now, I would have prioritized, I would have prioritized things differently for sure. I mean, I wasn't relentless in the right categories all the time, but I didn't know it. I just didn't know. I didn't know better. Is that fair? If you say it's fair, it's fair. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah. So I look back and, and, and that's what, that's what I believe. But you know, when I got hurt, uh, so, so playing tennis and baseball, like now I'm coming up in the eighties and early nineties. Right. And Moneyball hadn't happened yet. So Moneyball really would have served a guy like me, a player like me, but also we didn't know how to train. I knew how to train really hard. I was relentless in training, but I was also 
uh, looking back training in a very inefficient way and, and actually a detrimental way. So when I tore my rotator cuff and I realized all this serving and all this throwing is, 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 is repeatable damage to my shoulder, this isn't working. So when they give you that pat on the back and go, Hey kid, you'd make a great coach. That's a drop transition that I wasn't really ready for. But like, I, I did know that that would come one day, but it, it came long before the major leagues. I never made it to the major leagues. Right. right? I coached yeah. in the major leagues and I coached in the world series, but I never played in the world series. Right. Well, when that happened, so that's, that's interesting. So the, Hey, you'd be a great coach. So that's sort of like, um, it's probably a backhanded compliment, right? But it's also, a, there's a, there's a, there's like a finality to one other part yeah. of your yeah. dream. So yeah. how long did it take you to, I wish I could come up with an itty word for this, but how long did it take you to grab hold of that next? Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it took about, I think it took about one year, a process of one year, okay. which was a couple of things happened during that year. Um, one, uh, the ability to play was becoming painful. I mean, it was becoming this painful option for me, of which took me about four to five hours of training room time a day to play. Oh, okay. And I remember in one of my last games, like, you know, these last probably probably four to six weeks, I couldn't wash my hair after the game. I don't have a lot now, <laughs> but like literally I, I, I would use my left hand and, and just wash my hair. Cause like to lift my right arm up and just, to just reach there to do it was just the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. <laughs> so I, I learned how to watch and, and it was just painful. I'd, uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, just, um, um, just in, in just sheer pain, like stand up on the floor in bed because I rolled over on my shoulder in the night. And so you, you were just getting to this point, like, Hey, it was slowly uh, identifying itself that maybe this isn't, in, in my cards, maybe this isn't in my future. So as these little jabs of, of reality started sticking me in the ribs, man. And I was like taking shots and uh, kidney blows, you know, I was like, man, I, I got to look forward to something else. And if I've, and if I've got a shift, I, I, I got to shift to something I actually true desire, which is this continued audit of excellence of how would I continue to help athletes be their best? How can I continue to help people go out and, and create what they're dreaming about? Mm. And so I became a dream maker, man. I mean, cause you know, Mike, the funny thing was when I look back at like, when I went to my first world series, I was 25 years old. Right. And so 12, 13 years ago, I was running around my backyard, hitting a wiffle ball going, here comes Clark in the bottom of the ninth, you know, <laughs> the curveball comes in, it's deep to right field, you know, like, and I'm all excited and jogging around, blowing kisses to everybody as I won game seven, you know, and now I'm sitting in a dugout in Cleveland, Ohio. We're playing the Atlanta Braves in the world series and every kid on the field is actually living that dream. Right? We always say that, hey, you know, live the dream, right? Like very few people actually get to actually do it. So when I ask people, what are you dreaming about? I mean it. What are you dreaming about? Because you can do it. I, I love the movie The Edge, right? Um, you know, the old movie with Anthony Hopkins. He's all fired up like, what one man could do, so man can so get another. What one, one man can do, so can another. And that's right. And, and that takes me right back to being a 15-year-old kid sitting in front of that ex-big leader. Hey, if you want to know how to do it, go out and find somebody who's actually done it and talk to them. Get a mentor. Like, learn. You can hyper-learn very quickly from the people. And, and Mike, you, you've run multi-million dollar companies. You've written this great book. You're giving all these advice. Like, let me – you're brilliant, right? And, and – how many people a year come up and say to you, hey, I'd like to own a multi-million dollar company one day. Can you show me how you did that? Do more than five people come up to you a year and ask you that? No, I don't think five people in my life have asked me that. Why not? You've done it. You've yeah. done it. Like you're, you're awesome at it. 
Like it is an absolute superpower of yours. And people think like, oh, that's that's Mike uh, Testa. He owns that fabulous company. He's so successful. I I can't talk to him. Like, guess what, Mike? Let me let me ask you. you the things you've learned along the way, you've shared in a book. But if you saw a young person in their late twenties who wants to do what you've done, wouldn't you be honored to share that information to them? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, listen. If you're listening out there, and this is what you want, like make a list of five people that you think, I mean, the dream list. I'm talking, if you want advice from LeBron James, like fine, like make your list and start calling them up one by one. Listen, you can find them on Twitter. You can find them on Instagram. Ask the question, Hey, if I would commit to coming to meet you once a month, would you sit down with me for one hour and help me get, because I want to be someday where you're at. And guess what? You will not get to number five because someone will say yes. Hmm. That is great advice. Isn't that crazy? That is great advice. There's so many times in my life where I've been afraid that if I ask for something, it might be, I might be, you know, it might be embarrassing for me to ask, right? Because it's like so far out of my league. But when I do get up the courage and I just pick up the phone or I send the email or whatever I do to get something started, I'm almost always pleasantly surprised. One, because they, because I get a good, uh, get a response. I get what I want, but two, because, you know, I, I, and I think this is important. I'm, I, I ask in an appropriate way. That's right. Right. If you want help from someone, don't ask them for something as if their the expectation should be that they give it. Yeah. Be, you know, ask in a humble, really respectful. genuine way, respectful, respectful. Way. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and by the way, offer what I could do for you. Yeah. I mean, right. how many, st- how many stories have said like, Hey, listen to, to learn from you, Mike, about how I could one day own a multi-million dollar company. I would be willing to come to work for you for free for six months just to learn. And, and this is how I think I could contribute very well to your organization. These are a couple of the skills I have that I think would really add value. And this is what I would hope to get from you. Right. I'll tell you what I have gotten a lot more than five times, Trent. Okay. This will probably resonate with you. Um, I accept a, uh, a, a LinkedIn invitation connection. Um, and I, and the next thing I get immediately is an offer to improve the SEO on my website. Yeah. Like, you know, just some yeah. out of like, what, why would you think that anyone would be interested in something? You could very well help me. I mean, you could be great, Yeah. yeah. but uh, all the stuff that we just talked about, you know, be genuine, be respectful, be all of these things. Nope. None of that. It's just yeah. like, can I sell you something? <laughs> well, and I, th- I think you're touching on something really big for me, right? Which is um, big itty, authenticity, right? Like being genuine and authentic in all things always serves. And people struggle with that because, you know, we've got the, you know, we've got the complex, right? Of like, everyone's always better, right? The imposter syndrome and, and it's, it's scary out there, but like, for me, like, I truly believe like, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian guy. I believe in faith. I think God made everybody perfect. Like he didn't make any mistake. Right. So like, there's no error. And I'm not going to be the one who said like, Oh man, you know, God, you, you mucked it up. I should have been taller. <laughs> like, like, no way. Like <laughs> not a chance. Right. Like, so made me the way it's perfect. And like, I, the only thing I, I, I can just be the best me I can be and no one else can be that like you the genuine authentic article like boop you got a stamp on you like oh this is authenticated you know signed by your higher power whatever like you were made in one way and the dna and all and i'm a science guy right because i got a degree in physiology so like it it's amazing the, the the human body right is if you were like to take all the systems and put it together in, in today's modern money it would cost $500 million to recreate that system. 500 million, just the human body. Like how all the systems that have to work in conjunction with each other, $500 million. How many people do you know 
that are the authority and have their role and responsibility is of managing and taking care of over $500 million Very in few. a business. Very few. Very few, right? right? But all of us are entrusted that to ourselves each and every day. Like this is who we are. It, you cannot be replicated at any kind of cost. So like to not be your genuine, authentic, best self for people makes no sense to me. Do you have time for one more question? Always for you. Come on, man. Hmm. Okay. So you, your coaching was, was it 12 years or more than that? I can't remember. Yeah. So I, I started in 1993 with Sparky uh, and then the strike hit in 94. Great first year. And, um, and I ended in 2005. So better part of like 13 years. Okay. And during that time you were around arguably the the top one percent of all baseball players in the world best players in the world no doubt and you had mentioned earlier that you, you know even some of the best which may be natural a lot of it might be natural for them they have uh they do not have an audit of excellence mindset for themselves so yes. in your experience of those top one percent what percentage have this audit of excellence uh, mindset, I'll call it, because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering how many of those top one yeah. percent, like how, where does that narrow down? Yeah, yeah. So I would say that in in the top league levels, it's literally over ninety percent have that mentality. They like they are just special in that way. It's the separator, like like self discipline is a separator in business, right? When you talk about good leaders to great leaders, the self discipline is probably the one categorical one that catapults the good leader to great leader. Yeah. And there could be a lot of other things, a lot of mindset stuff, but that is probably the one for me. So um, when you asked me that, Mike, I, I immediately went to how many people have said, who's the best player you ever saw, Trent? And I'm like, oh yeah, you don't know them. Because physically gifted, way great, never got out of double A ball because didn't have the, didn't have the itties, right? No integrity, no humility, no spirituality, no accountability. And, 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 and you know, what we really want in our world, in our, on our teams, we really want a card. We really want aces. Because if we play a card game, and we sit out there and we go, man, if I got all the aces against you, Mike, I win, right? So I'm like, man, I want all aces. So my ace is an acronym for card is coachability, adaptability, responsibility. And they do those three things again and again and again, proving dependability. And so if I've got those four every time, like this is where we're back to, I'll take 10 more just like them. Mm -hmm. But here's a double A player. With all the talent, six foot four, 230 pounds, hits the ball like it comes off his bat, like you just, like you just pounded a ping pong ball. Thing is mashed, right? But I'm not listening. Coachability, I'm not interested. I'm already great. Just ask me. Uh, adaptability, um, you're having trouble with this off speed pitch. Well, I'm just going to hit home runs. I won't hit fastballs. Uh, at the top level, they'll know that and they'll never throw you one, <laughs> right? Like you're going to be found out, right? So adaptability, nope, I'm not interested. So he never works on the skills of adaptability. Responsibility, I won't be taking any from me. I'll be blaming. I'll be making excuses. I'll be doing other things because uh, whatever, it's somebody else's fault because I'm already great and there couldn't be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And dependability is like, hey, you know, how many times are we going to have to have this conversation, right? So not really dependable, can't count on them. So doesn't matter how much talent. It just doesn't matter how much talent. And you know what? I think I want to come to this adaptability because it's such a big thing right now. It's probably the number one thing I'd hire for today is adaptability because look what's happened in the last three years in our world. Like it's crazy, right? And we need to have adaptability. And it's very important. So I, I really put a stronghold on coachability, adaptability, this is all, all the card things really, but those two really stick out. But I'll tell you where people make a mistake in authority is they say, well, you know, Mike, I, I really need you to have some adaptability around these things, right? Great. So have I coached you up in the skill sets that I'm going to need you to adapt to, right? To, if I say, 
hey, listen, the swing's not looking great and we need to adjust off your fastball. I really need you to adjust the swing to the breaking ball. But then I never teach you that. I never give you reps hitting the breaking ball. I never work at the video that you're going to need to see to pick that up out of the player's hand of when that recognition of that breaking ball and all the things I can do that when I need you to adapt to it, this is the, this is the modern day issue in baseball. Hey, Mike, I need you to bunt. And everyone goes, nobody bunts anymore. We don't even work on it. No one's required to bunt. They don't even practice it. And then they go on the biggest game on game six of the world series. You go, Hey Mike, we need you to bunt. You're like, Man, I haven't bunted <laughs> since June. Oh, four. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> so I'm asking you to adapt but I didn't give you the skill set to adapt to. And then I go, geez, you see how Mel tested, mucked it up, like screwed it up for us. Like, wait a minute. I didn't help him. I didn't offer any value as a leader to say, hey, I need your adaptability, but I need you to have these skill sets that you need to adapt to. And this is where, if we're not telling these people, if we're not giving them those things of what we have to adapt to and be able to do and give them the skill sets and coach them up, then how are we helping them? We're just, we're just not. So you're saying that even if someone is naturally inclined to be adaptable, they might still might not be good at adapt at adapting because they don't know what you want them to adapt to. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That? If you ask me, what what's your what's your main company, Mike? My main well, I just sold. I, yeah, so I'm kind of in between, but I'll say my main company is How Did Happen LLC. Okay. Okay. So let's let's come back to the company you sold. That was yeah. in the refuse business, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was in the waste business. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you said, "Hey, listen, um, with your company, we need to adapt to um, in this refuse business to recycling. We're we're no longer going to be doing refuse. We're going to recycle everything." And I'm like, "I I don't know how to do that. Like, I I don't know like anything about recycling. I don't know like is that a special." You know, landfill is that do I go to a special place for that? Do I need special equipment for that? All these things. So you can say, hey, listen, now I want you to do this. But if I don't have any of the skill sets to do it, it's not going to go well, right? Yes. Like you can ask me to do it and I can muck it up for a while. But like, unless I'm shown what you need me to do and I develop some skills around that, I don't have any confidence in it, right? Because confidence is prep and reps. So if I don't have any preparation and I don't have any repetition around doing something, I'm not going to be very confident doing it. So if you're adapt, if you're asking me to adapt to something that I'm not confident in doing it, how well is that going to go? Probably not very well. Not very well. Not very well. Okay. I appreciate that additional context on that. Um, I said that was the last question, but since we're in the middle of a baseball strike and since you've got yeah. you know, a lot of, I'll ask you the question everyone asks you, you know, what do you think? What's, what's going on? What's going to yeah, happen? I got, I got to tell you, um, <laughs> sadly, you're going to be surprised by this. Uh, not following. Okay. I was part. I was Neither part of. I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was part of 1994 when you know I, I just didn't see it coming that um, they would cancel the World Series. Like um, that was you know obviously the only year uh, was 1994 that they did not have a World Series. So um, and and in fact uh, my 1995 ring right this is this is an O2. Um, I did go to the World Series in '95 and very uniquely on that ring it shows your records every year. So in Cleveland we were 100 wins and 42 losses in 1995 because because of the strike the, the, the season started late yeah okay. yeah they cut 20 games off the season so the top record by the way is 116 ever so if we had another 20 games hey do we win 16 out of 20 yeah, and maybe. tie the record or break the record you know so there was a there's a lot of like it was a really good team so um well you have the you best know, you wonder what could have been but uh the strike thing is um, it's a, it's a challenge and I certainly see both sides of it, but I think this is back to, um, you know, clarity and visibility has been gone for a while on this. And now all of a sudden um, trying to take a step back and, and create rules and guidelines that kind of got really gray for a long time is really difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if we ever, if you ever see a school teacher who lets everything go, right the first semester and everyone, you know, no one has to raise a hand. They can talk when they want to and get up out of their desk, go to the bathroom. Don't even ask for the hall pass. And someone walks in and goes, Holy cow. Like Clark's got no control over his room. Like the whole thing's crazy. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. The principal said we're all tightening this up. So after Christmas, the kids come back and I'm like, you raise your hand. If you're going to talk, you ask for the hall pass or you'll be in, you know, you'll be suspended for three days. They're like, wait, wait, what? Like, you've already established all these rules and now you've got to tighten it back up. 
that is a really, really difficult thing to do. So and hard. So I think that's where they're at today. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> you know, it, they're trying to tighten it, after like it's too late, right? Right. Well, just you know, it, what you just described there is like you see that in business all the time. It's like I've been letting this stuff go forever, right? Are they going to take me seriously? Like the guy who shows up at seven fifty-five instead of seven forty-five? Yeah. Are they going to take me seriously because I'm going to come out now and say, you know? hammer's coming down, you know, we're doing, yeah. no, it's right? like, no, it's yeah. Yeah. It's hard, hard to, hard to have that authentic authority. If you don't actually provide it yourself and you've allowed this all this time. And so, um, what you'd probably still, so, so my recommendation to someone would be don't start with everyone else. Start with you, nice. right? Yeah. You get that right. And then and, and, and by the way, this is why they call me, right? I get that right. Then my key executives get that right. Then our key VPs get that right. Then our management gets that right. And we go trickle down from the top. Now, we can do that in conjunction because I can do that also with the young people coming in, the new, uh, uh, very um, green and uh, what's the word for it? Um, uh, very impressionable. impressionable yeah, yeah I, I can train them up in the way I want them to go. Meanwhile, though, we'll have this big gap in the middle because the leaders are doing it and the early entry people are doing it. And everybody in the middle is like, yeah, you don't need to do that. No, yeah, we, we, it, we haven't done that around here like for years. And like, oh, this is how I was trained. I better stay the course, right? So we've got to close that gap fast. But that's how you change organizations. What has to be happening or who's the ideal sort of situation, who should be contacting you to help them? Yeah, I think uh, people who want their organization to, to improve, uh, who's yeah. looking to um, direct and build a culture and climate of coachability and productivity, right? We, we're talking ultimately, that's the ultimate itty, is what we really want is productivity. And we want to be, we want to have that. But, um, you know, this is like... Uh, Starting like, hey, I, I want to be 40 pounds lighter tomorrow too. <laughs> but importantly, I, I spent 30 years putting on the 40 pounds. Right. So it's not coming off. So I, I, I've got to take these steps to get back to that level. And it's the same way with productivity. I got, I got to do the things in the pyramid because the productivity is at the top of the pyramid. And so we get that. So we got to take the steps and make sure we build the foundation, right? Integrity, humility, spirituality, quality, so important. We got to get that foundation right and then build up with the right people, get the cards on the team, and then really train up our executive level with clarity, visibility, you know, all, all the things. So we really got to get that pyramid right to keep driving people. So the, 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 the pyramid of leadership is pretty important when we're talking about accountability for us. Jesus, like who knew there were so many words that ended in itty that were so powerful? Like I've been yeah. writing down every time you say one, I write it down. I'll send you the pyramid. You'll love the pyramid. Oh, would you? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that that in sure. the, yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, you, can okay. even, you can even take the quiz, man. You can even take the quiz. Like, oh. how am I? How am I on all these areas of the itties? Like, and, and when you grade yourself, you're honest with yourself. You know, you'll take some self-awareness and go, wow, uh, my foundation's strong. But like, when I really look at some of these things around, um, I've got some gaps. Like, yeah. what can I do to shore that up? And that's a great way we start with people. And the intention thing just resonated with me there because I immediately went to accountability and I say, you know, I'm a pretty good with accountability, but I have an intention to be always good with accountability, but I do not have a practice to be always good with accountability. Right. Yeah. Um, you and everyone else, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like don't beat yourself up on this. Like, right, right, right. right. Yeah. But as soon as I don't, as soon as I don't do that all the time, I'm telling people that it's okay. Like I just saw that. I don't like it. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, but I didn't say anything. So you're saying he just saw that. I know I'm not supposed to be doing that, but he didn't say anything. So it must be okay. Tol <laughs> you know? to tolerance is acceptance. Yeah. Tolerance is acceptance. Yeah, you just, and, and by the way, how about for, you know, the challenge really in business, right? Is, is we get in is a lot of like that bridge from having this great organization. I spend all this time developing and I miss this in my family. Right. So yeah. I like, oh, you know, my intent on accountability at work is spot on. Everything that I'm accountable to, I dot the I's, cross the T's, I'm nailing it. And then I come home and go, yeah, 
I mean, I don't know if I can get home at seven for dinner, honey. You know, 745, you know, well, I intended to be home on time. Right. You know, I intended to take you out Thursday nights. I, I intended to, you know, get the kids to school on, you know, get, get them to the ball game Saturday morning. But, you know, I got this client coming in and, they, yeah. you know, it's always like, well, all your intentions with our family is second. But accountability with business is always number one, right? Right, right? And it's like, oh, so I know where we stand. They'll understand. They'll so understand. I'm not saying it They'll out loud. Understand. I'm just all my actions say, hey, everyone, just so you know, you're number two. Right. Right. I hit, all the time you see that. Oh, yes. it's they'll, hard, man. It's tough. I, they'll understand. They know that that's the job. Yeah. You know, that they're, they're used to it. You know, all of those things that we say and. Yeah, they're probably not. They're probably not any of those things. They're no. putting up with it. We're justifying it, right? Like, yeah, hey, listen, right. everyone wants to go on spring break to Florida, right? Dad's got to work. Right. Mom's got to go bring home some bacon. You know, like we got to do the stuff and we're going to justify, justify, but it's tough, man. It, listen, like I said, Mike, it's not easy. And I, and I don't want people to go out there and be so hard on themselves. Like, hey, I'm not, I'm not doing this right every time. Like, hey, we're, we're all mucking it up a little bit, right? Yeah, for and sure. we're all trying to get better each and every day. But I think, you know, self-care and really, you know, getting to be your genuine authentic self is something that we can all vastly improve on and uh, we can work at it. And I'm okay. Cause you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, we're all still a work in progress. So everybody uh, you can connect with Trent. Uh, you can email him Trent at leadershipity.com. Of course, that's his website as well. Leadershipity.com his podcast winners find a way, check it out. Trent, thanks for all the itties. Thanks for all the, the, wonderful stories that you shared with us today. And, and thanks for making a big difference, man. That's what's really been cool about talking to you. I can tell that you are a difference maker and a dream maker. So you're a difference maker and a dream maker. Appreciate you being on. Thank you for having me, Mike. is brought to you by WinCheck Studios. We are an all-in-one educational platform for podcasters that revolutionizes how hosts leverage content to increase engagement with listeners, downloads, and income. We come together to focus on community, collaboration, and collective impact. For more information on how you can interact directly with our hosts, access exclusive live content with offers you can't get anywhere else from our official partners, join our purpose-driven community by visiting www.winject.com. If you're ready to build a career doing what you love, then we're ready to see you there.